Greetings, Mick. Half <laughs> Um Well, we have another uh, uh, late recording uh, of uh, of a paper um, uh, from uh, the ANZATS 2023 conference uh, for the stream uh, Faith and Science. Um, for some reason, we missed um, uh, Mick's uh, presentation. Uh, in other words, it was only half recorded or something like that. But um, uh, thank God for technology. So yeah. now let me uh, put things in a uh, in the official frame, saying "Warami." Um, good to see you in the Sydney language. <laughs> um, and uh, it's uh, uh, my honor and duty uh, to acknowledge the Garrigal clan. Uh, from whose ancestral lands I, I live. Uh, it's my pleasure to moderate uh, another paper in this uh, uh, special stream of uh, ANZATS, Faith and Science, a stream which, uh, uh, together with uh, Nicola Hogard uh, Cregan, uh, I have been um, convening since, uh, well, <laughs> two years ago or so. Uh, and uh, uh, we are, uh, Nicola and I, uh, we are representing the two major faith and science organizations uh, in uh, Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, East Coast, and uh, New Zealand Christian uh, Christians in Science, respectively. Now, we are listening to uh, Dr. Mick Pope, uh, who is a lecturer in meteorology uh, with a PhD from Monash University. Uh, who also has a Master's of Philosophy in Theology from the University of Divinity, uh, examining a theological basis for ethics uh, in the Anthropocene um, in the Pentateuch, has uh, written several books on climate change and a Christian response, uh, and his latest book, Creation to Canaan, will be published by Pickwick late in late 2023. Uh, Mick will be uh, talking to us uh, about pericaris, symbiosis, and the symbiocene. This must be your neologism. Navigating our way through the Anthropocene. Mick, the floor is yours. Thanks, Doro, and I'd like to extend my acknowledgement of the uh, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation down here in Nam or Melbourne. Uh, this, in a sense, represents an extension of my master's work, and it's a potential PhD proposal. So let me begin. Earth history has recently exited the relatively stable conditions of the Holocene for the unstable conditions of the Anthropocene. While climate change is the most discussed aspect, species loss is a significant concern. With extinction rates estimated to be about 100, that of the background rate, various labels have been applied, including necrocene, deformation, ecocide, and the sixth mass extinction. While ecocide promotes or provokes rather moral questions, the sixth mass extinction emphasizes earth history and poses a theodicean question. Why does God permit such catastrophic events? So this paper suggests a scientific observed phenomena as a hermeneutical or a heuristic principle and forms part of, a, as I said, a future PhD proposal. How can symbiosis provide a hermeneutic for a panentheistic theology of mass extinction and ecocide? I'll repeat that so I can pronounce it properly, but it's worth thinking about. How can symbiosis provide a hermeneutic or indeed a heuristic for a panentheistic theology of mass extinction and ecocide? Uh, sorry, I'm just navigating my slides. There we go. The World Wildlife Fund's Living Planet Index monitors changes in the relative abundance of almost 32,000 global species populations. The index shows an average 69% decline between 1970 and 2018. Wild animals now represent only 4% of total global biomass compared to 60% for domesticated animals. Estimates of extinction rates can vary considerably but are likely to be at least 100 times the long-term background rate. This has led many to dub the present extinction crisis as the sixth mass extinction event. John Sepkowski's study of marine life in the Phanerozoic reveals five major extinction events, 
where at least 39% of diversity was lost. The current mass extinction is one of the nine planetary boundaries that defines a, quote, safe operating space for humanity, characteristic of the relatively stable Holocene epoch of the past 11,700 years. Humanity is now passing these boundaries into a new geological era known as the Anthropocene. While human-caused species loss has been occurring since our ancestors left Africa, the current extinction is qualitatively and quantitatively different. Jason Moore, who's a historian, observes that the age of capital, 1470 to 1750, was defined by new technology, cheap nature, and cheap labor, where major ecological transformations took place over decades rather than millennia as preceded that. The appropriation of the quote-unquote new world involves slavery, extraction, accumulation, and dispossession. This dispossession and severing of relationship between people and soil links ecocide, that is the destruction of whole ecosystems, to genocide, the destruction of whole people groups. Contemporary ecocide is a continuation of the logic of settler colonialism. Hence, the present age is also referred to as the Capitalocene, or indeed the Necrocene, as I indicated earlier. One of the ways, uh, one way of addressing human caused extinction is to focus on the benefits of nature. So, for example, ecosystem services. Preserving planetary boundaries allows humans to continue to thrive and prosper. Others focus on ecocentrism over anthropocentrism and species extinction as a moral wrong. Ecocentrism has in turn led to the definition of ecocide as a crime against peace, subject to attention by the International Criminal Court. Unlike other crimes against peace, uh, peace ecocide is, quote, a crime against all life, not just human life, end quote. Some countries are now granting rights to ecosystems, such as the Wanganui River in Aotearoa, New Zealand, or to all of nature, as is recognised in Ecuador and Bolivia. Such approaches are, constructed, are constructive insofar as they can recognise that nature is the common heritage of humanity. When land moves from commodity to a community, we treat it with respect. Extinction occurs every year via interactions within a community. However, there have been significant events where, quote, the rate of species and clade extinctions increased dramatically compared to the observed background extinction rate. Such episodes are global, short-lived, and associated with substantial environmental changes. These events include the end of most dinosaur lineages at the end of the Cretaceous, 66 million years ago, due to a large asteroid impact, and the so-called Great Dying at the end of the Permium, 251 million years ago, associated with a prolonged period of volcanic activity. In this latter event, 96% of marine species went extinct as warming oceans became low in oxygen. Somewhat worryingly, simulations of ocean oxygen levels during the Permium extinction are broadly similar to those projected future losses of oxygen under anthropogenic climate change. Over 99.9% .9 of the species that ever lived on Earth are already extinct. Now, mass extinctions are natural as background extinctions, but pose questions for the theist. Theodicy is the problem that arises from, quote, belief in God coupled with the shared experience of suffering and evil. If this world is God's creation, what explains both the reality of evil and the common experience of suffering? End quote. Holmes Ralston sees a valuable place for contingency in the generation of value in nature, even when the process includes accidents that have no created value. An eschatological approach takes seriously not just extinction, but individual death and suffering. The problem of suffering and waste in nature is illustrated by the so-called backup pelican chick. Pelicans usually lay two eggs, the second of which is laid a couple of days after the first. The first chick is more aggressive and usually forces its younger sibling out of the nest where it dies of abuse or starvation. The backup chick hatches as an insurance policy in case the first dies. At the species level, this is a successful survival mechanism, yet it frustrates the individual's desire to flourish. Uh, Jay McDaniel wonders whether there is a pelican heaven where the insurance check has the chance to flourish in a way that it was not able to do during its existence on Earth. 
Catholic theologian Dennis Edwards lists four ways in which the redemption of non-human creatures might be imagined. They are, firstly, uni universal resurrection, where, quote, God's new creation as a literal waking and a gathering of every creature of every time, end quote. Secondly, objective immortality, where events in nature are received into God uh, and is saved by being taken eternally into God's feelings for the world. Thirdly, Ernst Conradi's view of history, the history of the cosmos being inscribed in the eschaton so that nothing is lost and there's room for the completion of lives that have been terminated prematurely. And then lastly, J. McDaniel, Daniel's subjective immortality. This view stresses that the lack of flourishing, not death itself, is the major evil. Redemption takes the form of a period of species-appropriate flourishing after which the individual animal dies. So in his pelican heaven, pelicans don't live forever. Now, while all of these models have merit, an appeal to eschatology kicks the can down the road. That is, what of the present suffering of creatures? Do creatures have to endure suffering, whether in the normal course of life and death, or as part of the disappearance of their own kind on their own? To answer this question, we need a useful hermeneutic to examine how God interacts with creation. The presence of suffering, death, and extinction have led evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins to declare that, quote, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, end quote. Right, nature is red in tooth and claw, according to poet Alfred Tennyson, and the evolutionary arms race is won through survival of the fittest, as Herbert Spencer proclaimed. However, an increasing emphasis on symbiosis would suggest that this is not all there is to life. Symbiosis was a term coined by Anton de Barry in 1879 to describe the close relationships between distinct species. These relationships can be mutualistic, parasitic, or commensalistic. In mutualistic symbiosis, both partners benefit, whereas in commensalistic symbiosis, one partner benefits where the other is left unharmed. Mutualistic relationships appear widespread. According to a paper by Gilbert Sapp and Torba, quote, symbiosis is becoming a core principle of contemporary biology and it is replacing an essentialist concept of individ conception rather of individuality with a conception congruent with the larger systems approach now pushing the life sciences in diverse directions these findings lead us into directions that transcend the self non-self subject object dichotomies that have characterized western thought sorry i've just got my pages mixed up uh, yeah no problem okay yep yeah, here i am no i'm i'm back now the examples of symbiosis of such symbiosis are diverse the eukaryotic cell of animals contains mitochondria which are evidence of ancient symbiosis as are the chloroplasts of plants um so briefly a, a, a eukaryote is a, a cell that has a nucleus that contains the DNA for its reproduction, but mitochondria, which produce the energy for the cell, have their own DNA. Likewise, in plants, the chloroplasts are the things that produce the photosynthesis. The study of lichens and their partnership of alga and fungi goes back to the studies of Anton de Barry in the 1860s and 1870s. In the Australian context, the Great Barrier Reef is constructed by coral polyps in symbiotic relationship with photosynthesizing algae. Or take the human gut, for example. It has a partnership with over 150 different bacteria, while the termite Mastodermes darwiniensis cannot digest cellulose without its gut symbiont. And in turn, it's difficult to understand a termite as an individual when the hive it's the hive that is the reproductive unit. Most recently, Suzanne Simard has developed the concept, the concept of the wood wide web. She claims that trees share carbon, water, and even information via a my myco mycorrhizal fungal network. A forest is, in this view, one vast community. 
Now, while this work is still considered controversial, it illustrates how symbiosis can potentially operate at larger scales. It has even been extended to incorporate the entire Earth system by James Lovelock in his Gaia theory. Now, theology is traditionally acknowledged that the creation reflects the nature of God. John Calvin declares that, quote, the faithful to whom he has given eyes see sparks of his glory, as it were, glittering in every created thing, end quote. Bonaventure compared creation to stained glass. The divine glory shines through it, even making it beautiful in its own unique and individual manner. Hence, I argue, if symbiosis is somehow a reflection of the nature of God, can symbiosis be a useful hermeneutic or heuristic for understanding both the inner nature of the Godhead and God's relationship to creation? Clark Pinnock states that the Trinity is, quote, an insight arising from the narrative of salvation, which is God's self-revelation, end quote. The economic trinity refers to the truth content of the gospel as revealed through revelation, particularly in the incarnation. The imminent or ontological trinity focuses on God's ontological nature, that is the inner being or life of the trinity. Now, this is logically prior to the economic trinity, but not directly apprehended by humans. A fruitful model of the imminent trinity is perichoresis, or perichoresis, depending on where you went to school, which John of Damascus describes as the, quote, mutual interpenetration of divine and human nature in Jesus, the God-human being, and for the reciprocal indwelling of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, following on from a reading of John 14.1. Thomas Torrance defines perichoresis as the way in which the three persons of the Trinity exist in one another, applying equally to all three persons. Perichoresis links the soteriological, that is the economic, with the ontological, the imminent, because it is, according to Colin Gunton, an, quote, implication of the unity and variety of the divine economic involvement in the world, end quote. The homoousial mutualistic relationship within the Godhead can be described as a symbiotic one. That in itself would be a whole thesis, but my particular focus is the symbiotic relationship of the Godhead and how it's extended to creation. The model of theism that best encapsulates this, in my view at least, is panentheism. Panentheism literally means all is in God, and hence emphasizes the imminence of God, and is based on Paul's quotation of the poet Epimenides in his speech in the Areopagus. That's Acts 17.28. At the same time, God is more than the world, hence still transcendent. Panentheism represents a middle path between the extremes of classical theism, panentheism, uh, pantheism rather, and deism. I hope people aren't offended if I'm calling classical theism extreme, but you get what I'm trying to say here. Paul Fides, um, so following Paul Fides, I seek to understand how God suffers with the world while being, quote, victorious over evil through weakness, end quote. Fides approaches suffering through the lens of panentheism to emphasize the relational love of God for creation. And I should say, when I originally delivered this, it was pointed out, and I was familiar with a quote from Aquinas, which emphasizes that, yes, um, he understood God to be imminent, um, but not with the same, I think, interaction or um and we'll get to that in a minute, interaction with the creation or affected by it. John Brearley identifies eight common marks of panentheism, three of which I'll mention briefly here. The first is the cosmos is understood as God's body. The second, divine dependence on creation and vice versa may be seen as a condition of cooperation between the two. And thirdly, possibility expresses God's suffering with creation as it suffers. Now, two scholars who have worked in eco-theology and panentheism are Jay McDaniel, as I mentioned earlier, and Sally McFaig. McDaniel is a process theologian who argues that while all life has intrinsic value, only individual animals have moral rights. His emphasis on divine pathos allows God to suffer with creation, while his process view implies God is not indictable for animal suffering. Yet animal suffering must also be redeemable by God. Such redemption may not be resurrection as per human hope, 
but a contribution to the divine life and the fulfillment of its own desires in the ongoing imminence of God. McFaig is a feminist theologian, or, or she was, the late Sally McFaig, who advocates a move away from a mechanistic model of the world to an organic one. Her goal is to understand, quote, the relationship of God and the world, what we should do, and how should we act in light of it, end quote. She therefore moves from a focus on the church as the body of Christ to the cosmos as the body of God. Such a model expresses a radical imminence of God while not confusing or identifying God with the world. This em divine embodiment implies that, quote, salvation is the direction of creation and creation is the place of salvation, end quote. So to put it another way, we are saved with the creation and not from it. There's so many uh, modern uh, understandings of the book of Revelation, for example, and rapture and all this kind of theology carries. How can symbiosis help us understand God's relationship to the world? Well, in my view, at least. Firstly, symbiosis potentially helps us to understand divine imminence and creation as the body of God. In the act of creation, God enters a symbiotic relationship with creation. Hence, creation is not the body of God per se, but creation and God is occupying the same space in symbiotic relationship, are a body that is, quote, more than creature and more than God. In a mutualistic symbiotic relationship, value is exchanged between the partners. Classically understood, creation gains from God, as in Psalm 104, verses 29 to 30. Uh, briefly, when you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take their, away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Lichens provide a useful model for this. Attempts to cultivate lichen symbiont separately pr proves very difficult, illustrating creation's relies upon God. It follows from a symbiotic hermeneutic that God also relies upon this partnership and gains, albeit unequally, from it. Much like coral polyps, God can exist without creation, but chooses not to. In a real sense, God is dependent on creation, just as creation is dependent on God. It further follows that harm to creation causes harm to God. Impassibility is inconceivable in, in this model. God grounds with creation is hinted in Romans 8. Divine relationship bears creation within itself in the midst of suffering until the eschaton is reached. And it's worth pointing out, as someone questioned when I originally presented this, that I'm therefore not arguing that if the cosmos were to disappear tomorrow, were to die, that God would die. It's this. It provides an eschatological environment that there's this symbiotic relationship God does not die and therefore brings creation to its fulfillment, but it's not merely kick down the can, the can kick down the road to the eschaton. Anyway, following McFaig, we need to move from a mechanistic to animate view of the earth. I've shown elsewhere in my master's thesis that the priestly tradition in the Pentateuch is animistic. Graham Harvey states that, quote, animists are people who recognize that the world is full of persons, only some of whom are human, and that life is always lived in relationship with others, end quote. Robin Kimmerer, uh, a Potawatomi botanist, calls us to learn that uh, the gr grammar of animacy, which is necessarily local in nature and reflective of the traditional peoples of a place. Australian Christian leader Uncle Graham Paulson observes that part of decolonizing Christianity in this country is the need to, quote, pay respects to the spirituality that has long been attuned to divine presence in this land, end quote. And as Randy Woodley argues, indigenous Christianities understand the earth as alive. And I've no doubt Dora will tell me that Eastern Christianity probably does similar, but the Western tradition has been far more inflexible in this regard. So if creation is then alive, our symbiotic relationship with it becomes more than a mere metaphor but genuinely relational. We move from the Anthropocene, where the raw exercise of human power seeks to dominate the non-human, to the Symbiocene. In this era, we do not minimize the dignity of our status as a Margot Day, but recognize our responsibility to live with a more than human creation for mutual benefit. That is, we move from an anthropocentric view to a symbiotic one, which is inherently relational. Thank you. Great stuff, Mick. 
Uh, yeah, my privilege now to uh, interact with you. Uh, I, I noticed uh, um, the fact that you, you already referred to uh, the conversation that mm -hmm. ensued your uh, initial presentation at the conference. Uh, so it, it, it's good that uh, uh, you engage the points made by, uh, by our colleagues. Um, from my viewpoint, I think you know uh, there's a lot uh, of uh, I don't know the Byzantine wisdom uh, in in what you say you know regardless of your uh, uh, sources or preferred sources um, I I I can't say that contemporary Orthodox are uh, so keen to affirm. Uh, a living earth which uh, uh, drives me crazy actually you know they have this very they have adopted this uh historicist or as you put it uh, just a few moments ago mechanistic kind of uh worldview uh, which from my uh, viewpoint disqualifies contemporary orthodox from their usual claim of uh, being uh, those who maintain or the the guardians of uh, ancient wisdom bye bye no longer mm. uh, and the fact that in in um, uh, with the exception of uh, uh, the patriarch of constantinople bartholomew and uh, a few other people uh, next to him uh, the rest of uh, um, well let's call it orthodox hierarchs uh, bishops uh, archbishops and all that uh, keep quiet about climate change about the anthropocene about um, the terrible um ecocide as you call it uh that um, modern humanity uh has unleashed upon the creation uh so all these point to uh, uh a disenfranchised orthodox christianity that has nothing to do with uh, those uh, medieval or early christian roots uh that it boasts about but there's something I, I was invited uh, to participate in a very interesting, well, let's call it experiment. Perhaps you noticed uh, that uh, these days uh, we have uh, many forms of uh, trying to, I don't know, make sweet uh, the peer review process, which uh, proved to be so far uh, cruel, many times uh, unjust and so on and so forth. And, I have been, let, let me share something with you. Sure. Uh, I have been invited to, what did I do? Sorry for this. Okay, share screen. Um, to write some kind of review to this book published last year. Sorry for this. Uh, I don't know if you know it. Ooh. Okay. So the whole mystery of Christ, published um, uh, last year at uh, Notre Dame uh, by uh, Jordan Wood, uh, the whole mystery of Christ, creation as incarnation in Maximus Confessor, highly recommended. So the, the experiment is uh, instead of writing, uh, you know, the the usual uh, uh, more or less congratulatory or otherwise. Uh, book review uh, four or five people have been invited to interact with uh, the author via commenting on on the book so this will be something like uh, an open uh, platform called the syndicate in the United oh States. yes 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 you know that oh you know yeah, that i do yeah. so um there's one i desperately need to read that's uh, an interaction with norman worsper's book which i've been reading um and hope to to kind of lean on for my my phd which is um this yeah. one this sacred life so wow. yeah they, they they do this all the time it's i think it's a really valuable it is uh, yeah. I, I love that their right. much uh and so, yeah well i i recommend this book i mean uh, the main thesis uh, of this guy uh wood uh, uh is that uh, maximus's christology and so i i uh, take my cue from what you said a few moments ago uh, Maximus's Christology uh, should be understood, uh, properly so, uh, as a model for a cosmology. Mm -hmm. And I think th this could um, uh, be of great help to you because, uh, according to Wood, 
he doesn't uh, call it necessarily symbiosis between um, uh, God and, and the creation or the universe, uh, but he um, extrapolates um, the idea of a, a theandric structure of Christ, you know, divine human uh, interaction within uh, the person of Christ uh, on a global scale. Uh, showing that uh, uh, what we contemplate in, in Jesus Christ as the God-man uh, is actually the principle at work um, throughout the creation. So th this this might uh, give you, you know, uh, I don't know, some kind of uh, theological backdrop uh, coming from mm -hmm. the Middle Ages. Uh, and um, regardless of what um, uh, your Orthodox critics will have to say, because they always have something to say about uh, anything that sounds unusual to them, uh, well, uh, kick them hard with Maximus the Confessor. Yes, I have the reference that you gave me at the time. <laughs> Was it uh, Sympasia? Ah, oh, no, breathing it, together. Oh, no, no, it's similar. Uh, let Let me write it down because I, 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 I wrote I'm, it down and then um. Okay, it's uh. But I can't read my own writing. Uh, oh, okay, it's uh. Well, if you can, you, you can write it. Sim, no, yeah, sim. Yeah, uh, coming up. Sim oh, okay. So oh, S Y M P N O I A, uh, which okay. is a, a concept uh, uh, repeatedly um, deployed by Maximus in his book uh, To Thalassius. Uh, I think I had it somewhere right here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I found it. Responses to To Thalassius. Yeah, 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 this one. There you go. Okay. Excellent. And, yeah, and. Um, yeah, uh, it doesn't appear cosmologically if I uh, if memory serves. Uh, so it's still um, unread. Well, I read it long ago in Romanian. Um, but uh, yeah, this concept I think is very useful. Uh, he deploys it in a number of settings. Uh, yeah, talking about this, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, visceral kind of interaction between God and, and various parts of the creation. Lit, the, the word literally means breathing together. At least that's how I prefer to, to translate it. Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, shared breath. You know, this is such a, an intimate form of uh, uh, representing uh, the interaction, fundamental interaction between uh, God and uh, and the universe and every part of it, you know. Mm. Um, yeah. I noticed uh, that you you haven't mentioned Moltmann. Uh, aren't you a fan of Jürgen Moltmann? Or oh, it's not that I, I haven't read any Moltmann. It's just I haven't read enough. Um, I mean, see, I've come at this, I suppose, out of um, three years of doing a, a master's degree in in Hebrew Bible. So I've come from a particular mm, yeah, area, yeah. and then dived into well. Now, many years ago, I, I did a bit of work on Romans 8, and so I was looking at eschatology, and I came across some of the things I, I mentioned, like Jay McDaniel, for example, and then Sully McFaig was the boogeyman for a conservative Christian friend of mine, <laughs> so I read her. Um, so it's it's really just reflecting limited yeah. reading at, at this point in time more than, yeah, I've, I mean, I've, I've read some Maltman. Um, yeah, you know why, why I mentioned, because... Uh, well, I haven't read. Uh, I, I'm certain you read uh, much more of his stuff than than I did. Uh, but uh, some time ago, uh, when I was more involved in environmental discussions, uh, now I'm just feeling for the whole topic. But I'm less interested, uh, less invested, say academically. Mm. Uh, I I, uh, I kept in touch with him for a while, and uh, uh, he even was kind enough to send me a signed copy of his God in Creation, uh, which I read and uh, used for a while. Um, and I think there are some important concepts there. For example, he uh, he says that the problem uh, with many Christians not acknowledging uh, these are this is my paraphrase not acknowledging. Uh, the footprint, the negative footprint of of humanity on Earth, uh, comes from individualism. So mm. we live in this very individualistic culture where it's me, myself, and I. Uh, and um, uh, this has a broader, uh, uh, how do you call it, a broader ramifications. So it's anchored uh, uh, in uh, more deeply 
in a modern worldview that is atomistic, literally. So atom, atomistic, right. but where everything is uh, separated from everything. Uh, you, you can consider this cell uh, um, by itself without uh, realizing how important uh, the cell is in the company of, uh, of the other cells, you know, and that it doesn't actually do, uh, uh, do its job uh, outside um, uh, this interlink uh, with, mm -hmm. with other um, uh, cells and so on and so forth. And he says, well, um, this is a monadic uh, he used the the, the uh, concept of Leibniz. Uh, this is a, mo a monadic uh, uh, representation of reality, and we have to change it because uh, the monads have windows. Uh, I, I I remember it's, it's a beautiful mm. metaphor. So uh, you have all these atoms that, but they, they don't exist by themselves. Right. Uh, cell doesn't exist by by itself. An organism, whatever, uh, whatever being, or even a species doesn't exist by by itself. All the monads have windows, and and they they say hi to each other, then communicate. And mm. it's a beautiful metaphor. And also in in uh, God in creation, I remember there's something that reminds me of well your. Uh, approach from the theodicy angle i think is very important you know uh and you dare to talk about a god that suffers which is such a uh profoundly christian perhaps broadly religious concept of a, a suffering god uh, and moltmann there in order to sell the idea uh refers to um, the jewish concept of shekinah are you familiar with this one yes 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 and uh, uh, he says, well, for, for the Jewish people, the uh, Shekinah is this uh, historical double of God that suffers mm -hmm. with uh, uh, with Israel in history. Uh, and and Moldman takes the concept of Shekinah and transforms it into a, a cosmological concept or environmental concept, if you like, uh, where um, uh, the Shekinah is uh, that, uh, that God, uh, that divine side or that side of God that... Uh, does not endure uh, the suffering of the of the world and uh, if nothing else can be done uh, given certain uh, 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 let's say physical constraints at least god can uh, suffer with the, uh, with the creation it's it's beautiful i don't know uh, i would yeah. I, i'd revisit uh, moltmann's ideas i have in fact i've got a copy of god in creation open <laughs> i've got a copy of the gifford lectures so yeah, it's a it'd be a good place to go back. But again, it it's just been um not a not, not a lack of interest in Moltmann, but just uh, just where I'm at at the moment with my reading. No, I know that that's yeah. something. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. I, but I think he's an important read. What do you reckon? Uh, why do many Christians, in fact, uh, across the spectrum, resist the idea of uh, an anthropogenic? Uh, uh, Anthropocene, <laughs> say, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, there's any number of things, I suppose. Um, the Western Christianity, certainly, you know, Reformation Christianity is very focused on the individual. It, it is, as you say, very atomistic. Um, and we've absorbed, well, is it chicken and egg, I suppose, that we absorb it from the broader culture and adopt it theologically or vice versa. Some kind of symbiotic relationship, I suppose, if you'll forgive me. <laughs> um, uh, and and so yeah, and and following on from that, there's just been a, a genuine lack of interest or denigration of the creation. There's also the constant, somewhat hypocritical fear of syncretism, of of not wanting to be confused with you know have Christianity confused with um, other faiths or other world systems. Whereas some of us are very keen to see what are the things that we've missed from our own perspectives. And so um, I just noticed on Twitter, there's um, a new book coming out on a Sami Christian theology of creation. In Norway. Yeah, in Norway. And uh, that's Oh, wow, fascinating. wow. That's great. Yeah. Um, so there's, I, the Western tradition is just, as you say, becomes very, very atomistic, become very internal. Um I guess that's the enlightenment. It's the separation of church and state and all this kind of the faith is about the inner life and um, all the things that uh, someone like myself is is prone to ignore. 
but you know we've made it an either or rather than a continuum of from the heart outwards type thing and so we we downplay it and then i think too one of the things people find very threatening well in general terms people find very threatening being confronted with their sins but being confronted with the fact that our entire worldview um, and ways of viewing the world our economics our politics it's all built on a, a false foundation or a shaky foundation or there's things that we could do better uh, is is very very threatening so we're so wedded to dare I say it, Western capitalism and individualism is all one big package. We've just, it's the Babylonian captivity of the modern church that we're just consumers of a religious experience uh, and religious products. And it just bleeds over to everything. And so you don't want to be told or have it pointed out that there are profound consequences to the way in which you live your life. And it challenges the very things that you believe, um, you know, because we believe things that are comfortable, <laughs> we, mm. um, not things that are uncomfortable typically. So and and so what you see now, I suppose, is seeing more and more, certainly the political sphere, if not the religious one, uh, are willing to accept that it's a reality, but an unwilling to see that as important or our responsibility. Um, oh, yeah. Look, greenwashing. Look, uh, yeah, p politics uh, yeah, or, and politicians are a, a different uh, brand of humanity um, if they maintain their humanity at all. Uh, so my 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 concern is with with Christians across the spectrum, and I think uh, yeah, there's something uh, very profound uh, to what you just said. You know, uh, people's uh, lack of courage to acknowledge mistake, failure, sin. Uh, you know, we are Christians. We are better than others. Uh, we are the the elect. We are the saints, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, predestined to glory or uh, whatever trudging to to get there and stuff like that um but still we we don't want to uh acknowledge the fact that we got things wrong and mm. this, this is uh, 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 a mistake a failure on our part you know uh, that uh, has uh, terrible consequences because uh, with uh, the millions of christians across the world including in the so-called first world uh we practically um, contribute to um nurturing the polit political economical whatever industrial narrative mm -hmm. uh that uh uh causes so much uh, problems and we only recently managed to uh, got to realize it thank you wow and, and this is why, Doru, I, I had a, a friend of mine who was um, vegan and a former Hare Krishna and, and this, that and the other, and obviously environmentally aware. And she would say to me, why are you restricting yourself to the church? You know, why aren't you there out there writing books or, you know, speaking in the public sphere, which is something I want to do and something that's a bit complicated by my dual life as a public servant. And there's, there's nuances and, and need to walk a fine line, but and my response was because the church is still an important and influential voice in many ways, uh, even though it's in decline, as you say, politically, it carries some weight. So if you can shift thinking in those areas, uh, get people to reconsider theology to a greater or lesser extent, and you know, you can bolt on environmental concern to just about any theological framework you like. I think there's a need for a profound shift in evangelical thinking, for example. That's the the, the theological um, soil out of which I come, although um, it's not a label I'm enamored with using these days, but if you could turn turn them in, into a, a force for so speaking up, speaking out, then you'd have some more significant impact. Or if Pentecostal, Pentecostalism as a whole embraced climate change as a cause and expression of their spirituality, imagine the impact of that. Yeah. Um, so and it, it's the same it's the same way with the orthodox in the so-called traditional orthodox countries in uh, southeast and eastern europe uh, at least those uh, where but the orthodox are the majority and they don't do anything mm. don't don't do anything environmentally speaking uh, to uh, influence uh, you know uh, um, environmental policies and, and stuff like nothing uh, uh, except for uh, the Green Patriarch, you know, uh, Bartholomew of mm. Constantinople, uh, no one has um, a any kind of sustained activity uh, in that regard. Uh, again, and th uh, those are uh, uh, 
parts of the world, at least uh, of the old world, the old continent, uh, where um, uh, there's a lot of industrialization still happening, mm. uh, a lot of pollution and, and so on and so forth, and, and, and the church doesn't do anything there. So uh, it's across the spectrum, and, and I think it, it harks back to what you said, well, people don't want to confess their sins. <laughs> it it's i mean the, the the real issue ultimately is that we i mean people can do and there's a tendency to be able to do that but you do that on an individual level but it, it's so much harder a a barrier to cross to think about it in a systemic point of view uh it you know you don't ask a fish to repent of swimming in water we swim in water which is a way of understanding the world um that at times is so counter um, to our faith, but we don't recognize it because we've just been so colonized by that thinking. Uh, and it, I, w- I wonder if we hadn't had Constantine, if it would have been so, so much of a problem. I mean, I'll, 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 my argument these days, perhaps it's a bit too bullshit, is that all things come down to empire yep. and, and, and how we've been co opted by power and we co opt power. So, uh, in my understanding of, well, how do you apply the book of Revelation to today, for example? Well, the empires are. are Exxon and others who lie and continue to lie about the impact of their product uh, on whom we're unfortunately very dependent as a direct result. Just as a, for instance, so it's just that inability to see as Walter Wink does that institutions and organizations can become satanic insofar as they're no longer encouraging uh, or leading to the purposes of God in, in creation and human beings flourishing um, and are acting instead to their destruction. So yeah. and once you become so wrapped up in that, it just becomes very difficult to see that that's something you need to repent of. Yeah. Um, when the church becomes the empire. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I remember listening to a lecture a while ago. Um, I don't remember who was the speaker, but it was a very, very interesting um, um, comment on, on revelation the book of revelation uh don't remember the chapter but it was that uh, image where uh the, the lady an image of the church or the kingdom uh or god's people uh was hunted down by by the beast you know mm. the empire uh and uh who uh, gave her shelter was the creation mm. the world I don't remember. Uh, must be the words uh, chapter eighteen or so. Uh, but there, there's an image there where where it's 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 the world, it's the earth that takes sides with the lady, the church, mm. against the uh, aggression of the empire. You know, uh, and and uh, Christians are no longer there because uh, <laughs> of what you said. You know, uh, the lady has become the empire. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. uh, and contributes um, uh, sometimes unknowingly, sometimes knowingly, uh, to the uh, uh, policies of the empire uh, against uh, the ally, the earth. It's it's yeah, terrible. Yeah, I've just got a Revelation eighteen open in front of me, and there's this call: "Come out of her, my people, so that you do not take part in her sins, and say so you do not share in her plagues." And I actually. Um, when I spoke at the ISCAST um, meeting in Melbourne, which unfortunately you weren't able to come to, uh, I quoted that in, in that context of Revelation being such an anti-empire book. It, it calls out um, Caesar and the, the Senate as, um, uh, you know, the whore of Babylon. It's, it's yep. the, these men in drag um, yep. and then calls out the merchants of the earth and the, the nation, the kings of the earth for participating in this. And there's a, a really interesting quote from... And I'd have to bring up the presentation. Let me just see what mm. I can find. The talk by a, a, a Christian historian, and he describes the, the first century Roman Empire in ways that this sound for all the world like modern um, modern uh, globalization in terms of the extended trade routes and specialization. And I'm just trying to find the, here we go. This is it. So it's, uh, professor of ancient history Keith Hopkins, oh, yeah. and he he observes that that the Rome lived in luxury, and of course the 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 soldiers on the edges of empire were well fed, but a lot of the empire lived in relative or actual poverty, and he describes an increased monetization of the Roman economy, the commercialization of exchange, 
and elongation of the links between producers and consumers, uh, the growth of specialist intermediaries, traders, shippers, bankers, and an unprecedented level of urbanisation, which is a key um, factor in, in the Anthropocene, the shift from rural to urban. So it all for all the world sounds like modern um, you know, global capitalism. Um, and while globalisation you know, has mixed benefits and trade has mixed benefits, nonetheless, it's this calling out in in revelation about empire and the cult of Caesar and the inclusion or exclusion of um, of individuals on the basis of whether or not they follow the, the 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 dominant narrative. And what's really interesting is that when you get to the return to Eden in Revelation twenty one, the, the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations and not just individuals. And so it points to, I think, the mission of God in the world through the church is ultimately to engage in the world of politics. It's not to withdraw from the world. It's not to expect that we'll reach utopia or whatever, but to be those agents of God making all things new, which was a book I wrote a few years ago on climate change and revelation. Oh, great. Thank you very much for, for sharing all this, uh, Mick. It's always a pleasure to uh, listen to you and to converse with you. It's been great. Thank you, Dara. It's been fun. And I, uh, I, I hope uh, the viewers will uh, enjoy seeing uh, now the complete series uh, of Faith and Science at the ANZATS 2023. Once again, many thanks.